Hi, everybody. I'm so happy for us to be together again. You know that. You know that. You know what I'm going to tell you every time we talk. I'm always happy for us to be together. And what else? What else do you know? You know that I love you, and I know you know it. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> and you can't do anything about it. Okay? You can't do a thing about it to know that we have such a splendid guest today. Now, I, I had not. I, I'd heard. So many things um, about Patrick Tracy. But today we want to do something a little bit more. We want to get to know Patrick. We want to get a chance to um, to know who he is and why uh, why he uh, why he is as he is. Welcome to Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, thanks. Hi, Patrick. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well too. And I'm 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 in here and I'm talking on Skype and on the telephone and so I hope okay. I hope that things I hope that things are well. I, I'm 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 uh, I'm gonna I'm hoping that what's it like growing up for you? I must say that the period growing up in Northern Ireland was both interesting and, 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 and quite difficult. When we went to school originally we were given an awful amount of freedom in terms of allowing to use our own intuition and to use um, our own ability and I, I I suppose I particularly excel at science. So by the time I was 15, I'd won the British Amateur Young Scientist of the Year competition, and when I was um, one year later, I won the Aer Lingus, um, which is a big company in Ireland that sort of has got um, an airline industry, and I'd won their Biochemist of the Year. And um, this had brought me, I suppose, different um, places in my life, and I met Harold Wilson, the sort of Prime Minister at the time, and also, I had um, a very interesting uh, experience from the point of view that I was one of the first people that discovered that sounds in some way could influence plants. And um, as a consequence of that, and I can speak about that later because it was funny, um, this brings me into an interesting story regarding Michael Jackson because I suppose when I was young, we, we, we had a lot of freedom to do what we wanted. and We were all straight-A students and out of our you know, class at college, this is just at high school, out of 13 people, there were nine doctors, originally 11, but it ended up with nine doctors out of, out of that group, which is oh. highly unusual. And it was highly unusual for a couple of things. The first thing is that sort of a Catholic growing up in Northern Ireland of the period was, was quite difficult because there, no matter, we can look at it reflectively now, there was certainly discrimination against sort of Catholics growing up, but we had the British education system, which was very fair, and it's one thing that I suppose gave everybody a leverage at that stage. And when I um, went to high school originally, we were allowed to do our own experiments. And believe it or not, looking back on some of the original experimentation and things we'd done, I had unwittingly almost discovered the CD player when I was about 15. <laughs> and I was using laser, piezoelectric um, uh, photo cells. And um, we used it, believe it or not, as, as, as a burglar alarm. And the most in incredible thing, we had like a radio playing in one room, and the radio waves being modulated by just the sound itself, merged the photoelectric cells, and we didn't realize what we were doing. We were probably ahead of our time. The sort of things you couldn't do in this day and age, because things are much more conformist and everybody has to do their own thing, but <laughs> you can imagine a 15-year-old with a total physics lab to play with. The story I will talk about regarding Michael was that one of the experiments that I had uh, done at the time was that I had taken an audio frequency oscillator, and for those that are listening that don't know what that is, that is just a machine that creates sound waves of a certain wavelength. And you can change the wavelength and it will go from almost like somebody singing. And um, I discovered at a certain wavelength that a plant called mung bean grew much higher. 
And at the time, we didn't have that much money growing up, and I required, believe it or not, a certain thing called acoustic wadding. That means that the sound wouldn't escape or that no sound could come into where the experiment was. And my father, who was a great man, absolutely wonderful man, and he got into this, and because he knew I needed this particular type of wood, he went outside our garage and he cut down the main sort of sign advertising sort of our business that we were growing up. And when I woke up in the morning, we had two different experimental boxes, all made for me with the speakers in them and everything. And I went forward and I sort of won that. And I was chatting to Michael in the house one night about this, and he was absolutely fascinated. And he turned around and he says, you know, I've always known that sort of sound can influence plants. And I said, Patrick, how do you think that worked? And Michael would have that cheeky sort of grin in his face that I knew he wanted me to say, oh, the plants love sound, and when they had a certain <laughs> sound, they, 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 would have, they grew higher. And I was sort of just messing with him, and I said, well, you know, had I known you at the time, and had I known Heal the World, I would have played that through the speakers. And he was laughing at that, and he says, well, how do you think it worked? And I knew he wanted me to say it because the plants loved and cherished sound. But instead I turned around because one of the theories of how it worked was possibly that the sound at a certain wavelength was vibrating the soil, and it was releasing these things called negative growth inhibitors. And one of them is in ethylene gas, and just to wind Michael up, I said to him, um, oh, I think how it worked was, you know, this particular sound um, shut the soil, and as a consequence of that, it released negative inhibitors, and it sounds great. It's simple as that, just a scientific thing. And he looked at me sort of all disappointed with that boyish sort of look in his face. He says, he's saying, Tracy, I don't know whether you're trying to wind me up here or not. But he just turned around and says, oh, well, if that's the case, you know, what we should have done was, Play it Billy Jean right up high, you know, and let them rock <laughs> all the soils at once, you know. Yeah. That is fascinating. That is absolutely fascinating. I know um, that we titled your show "The Road Not Taken." Yes. And uh, me, I've got to. I, I must let you know. Uh, I love. I love poetry. In fact, so my yeah. my aunt was like the poet laureate for Illinois, ah. and and so I I love it. And I grew up with poetry. Now, the poem that that had a great effect upon my life was If by Rudyard Kipling. Yes. And so you have the road not taken. Do you, did you commit it to the, memory? The road not taken is a very interesting poem. Well, we know it's by Frost. It was um, written in 1916. And um, in some ways, it's a very sort of um, iconic poem. And it certainly is built around that penultimate line, I took the one that's traveled by. The poem starts off, the first couple of verses of it are, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could. To where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the best claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Now this is an interesting line, because there's no doubt about it, adventure in life or otherwise is a step down an overgrown path. And I suppose the step that sort of um, he's talking about, he's saying sort of he who never walks save where he sees men's tracks makes sort of no discoveries. You know, and you almost have to push aside the tangled adventure beyond the, the, the sort of mainstream, but there's no doubt about it. The last two lines, I took the one that's traveled by and that has made the difference. And in some ways, there's no doubt about it, we use this in terms of our own rationalizing our decisions, be them with pride or regret, and there's no doubt about it. I suppose in some ways the poem is a panning into individualism and nonconformism. And to a lot of, I suppose, my time growing up, I suppose in some ways I was a courageous non-reformist, and that sort of got me into a lot of interesting scenarios, be it... Iran during the period of Dalatullah Khomeini, be it in Kurdistan during the period of the Iran-Iraq War, where I, I sort of eventually became a prisoner under Saddam Hussein, be it in Berlin when the wall came down, and many other interesting places and beyond. So there's no doubt about it. I suppose it is an apt practice for the show we're having tonight for the interview. But we wanted to, I want to hear more about uh, 
Iran and Iraq. Okay. Okay, so talk to us about that. Sure. Um, well, I suppose 